Good evening. My name is Patrick Lewis, and I'm the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad you're able to join us for tonight's lecture. I'm happy to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Abigail Glogauer, Curator of Jewish Collections and the Jewish Community Archive at the Filson Historical Society. Abby earned a doctorate in American Art and Visual Culture from the University of Rochester with a focus on group identity formation and representation in the 19th century. She has conducted education, programming, and curatorial work in libraries and museums, including the Brooklyn Museum, the Spurtis Museum, the George Eastman Museum, and the National Women's Hall of Fame. I'll now turn the program over to Abby and then rejoin after her presentation to moderate questions as time permits. Thank you so much, Patrick. All right, are we good here? Thank you so much, everybody. Um, when I initially planned this workshop for uh, Family History Month, I thought maybe it would be great if 50 people showed up. I wasn't expecting this many to register. Um, and I think it's just fantastic. Um, so welcome. I'm going to pretend that this is still, as we would say in Yiddish, a Hamisha, a Sifa, a, 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 an intimate gathering, a, a cozy gathering. Um, and we're going to be working on exploring our family history, our personal and family history. And we're going to be doing it in two parts. Spoiler, I'm not going to tell you how to do everything there is to do. It's just not possible. But we're going to go on an exploration together um, in two parts. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, share screen. So bear with me. You'll still be able to see me um, in micro view. And I'll give you just a little bit of background about how this uh, workshop uh, came about. I suspect that part of the reason, um, oops, me. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if part of the reason there's a lot of interest in this topic right now is because certain circumstances in our world over the last six months have caused us to be spending more time at home <laughs> with our families, in our houses, and with our stuff. Um, and so in a way, it's really kind of timely. I know a number of people in my own, you know, family and my own sphere are using some of this time to go through things in their house and they're thinking a lot about their family history. So uh, I wouldn't exactly call it a silver lining to COVID, but I think it's time, it's a timely topic. The origin for this workshop though actually began before COVID in a land far, far away known as a uh, December 2019, when none of this was on the horizon. Um, as Patrick mentioned in my introduction, what brought me here to Louisville and to work at the Filson Historical Society was a grant-funded initiative to work on Jewish history here in Louisville and the Ohio Valley region, and to specifically focus on doing outreach in that uh, particular community, in the Jewish community. So what I was noticing in a lot of my conversations with people, I would hear these kind of refrains over and over again and tell me if this resonates with you or someone you know. People would say to me, I have all of this stuff in my house. I have all this rich family history. I don't know what to do with it though. My children don't want it. They're not interested in it. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to preserve these stories. So I started thinking, what if we started doing workshops together to think about that and explore that together? And we got to do this once in person at um, one of the local synagogues, Knesset Israel, back in February, and then COVID hit and it changed everything. So now we're cycling it back around um, for Family History Month. Uh, and so we're going to, you know, try it on a Zoom format. I wish that we could all be in the room together, but we kind of are digitally. So a brief overview of how things are going to go. Tonight, this is a two-part workshop. Um, so I hope that you will come back next week if you feel inspired to do so. Or if you know anyone else who's not here tonight who might want to join in next week, um, invite them so they can come. Roughly speaking, this is the relationship between the two parts, session one and two. Tonight 
is going to be about big concepts. We're going to be talking a lot about ideas, um, terminology and concepts that we use uh, in the archival world and also, you know, in the practicing historian world. And the idea is to kind of get your minds thinking. I'm going to give you some very, very light optional homework. Um, and when we reconvene next week, we're going to be a little bit more focused on practicalities. We're going to dig in a little bit deeper with how to enact some of the archiving work that we're introducing tonight. So roughly speaking, that is the difference between part one and part two, or the relationship rather. So at the outset, I want to acknowledge something very important, which is that out of the, you know, hundred or so people who are here tonight, we are all individual human beings that come from unique, different backgrounds. We have different families. We have different stories. There's some commonality between our stories, um, and it's really interesting and useful to search for that. But when we're talking about family history, we also have to think about the different directions and perspectives that we come from. So as I mentioned, this workshop was originally created for a Jewish audience. And I was raised in a Jewish family. And so I was thinking a lot about how certain kinds of cultural considerations impact the way that we relate to history and the way we relate to collecting history. And for the purposes of tonight's workshop, how that comes down to the family level. So I am not equipped to speak for everybody's different backgrounds, but I will share by way of illustration or demonstration at the outset, again, thinking about how we don't all relate to history in the same way. Some of the cultural impacts, I would say, that, in, that influence my own family and community aspects or, um, excuse me, orientations towards history are that we come from a culture that does a lot of saving. There's a lot of emphasis on books and texts. And in fact, in traditional Jewish practice, you are not supposed to throw away any written or published material that contains the name of God in it, whether that's a prayer book or a marriage contract or any number of items. Those things are actually traditionally supposed to be buried. They're kept in community repositories. They are not thrown away. So here on our left, we can't go into it too far, but you can Google Solomon Schechter, one of the, one of the great um, minds of, of Jewish thought, one of the founders of the conservative denomination of Judaism in the late 19th century, studying the fragments from the Cairo Geniza, which was an unbelievable collection of materials unearthed from a, an ancient uh, Jewish community in Egypt where all of those materials of daily life, anything that had the name of God had been stored inside a synagogue and then kind of preserved over time. Um, and so he's there thumbing through it and it gives us you know, a scholarly look into the past, right? So I know that I come from a saving people that takes books and papers in particular, very seriously, almost with a degree of holiness. Unfortunately, I also come from a cultural background where there is a lot of inherited cultural trauma and disruption in our history. Uh, my own great grandparents came to this country in the early 20th century as refugees from Eastern Europe. Um, they did not speak the language here. They had a lot of work to do to become integrated into the United States. Um, but they fared better than, you know, some, some others as well. Uh, and so I would say another cultural consideration that comes to bear on, you know, my own inherited perspectives about history and saving comes from trauma and disruption in the form of persecution. Uh, what you're looking at here is a photograph of um, a display of uh, suitcases at the Auschwitz uh, concentration camp museum in Poland. These are real suitcases that were taken from detainees and prisoners as they were admitted into the camps and ultimately killed there. Um, and each one of these suitcases, you know, represents a, a, a family 
a person who was uprooted from their place um, and, and transferred to another place and their history uh, was, was uh, you know, destroyed in some ways along with their lives. So I bring these things to bear because I want everyone to start thinking right now about what are some of the traditions about history or the ways that you have been raised to relate to history in your own family. Um, and there's no one right way or wrong way, but only a recognition that we bring a lot of different background to bear on our relationship to history. For some of us, history is, is a source of pride. For some, it's a source of pain. And it can also be both of those things at the same time. So when we talk about family history, what are we talking about? And it's actually a combination of a lot of different things that, are, that relate to each other. So one thing that is an integral part of family history is, of course, genealogy. And I'm sure we have some genealogists in the crowd. And I applaud you and I salute you because genealogy research is a really particular type of intellectual activity that um, I'm really bad at. But I married someone who's good at it, so it helps, right? Genealogy is really the tracking and the documenting of where you come from, you can trace your family lines back through places and times and all the different branches, who married who and where they lived and what year people were born. That is like a raw, it's almost like just a skeleton of family history um, to kind of track that basic information. Obviously, though, there's more to family history than just genealogy. There are other things as well. We have stories that are passed down to us from um, generations. And we also have our own memories as well as we cycle through time. So stories and memories kind of graft onto genealogical information. But then we also have the stuff of history pictures, objects, and papers. And so we're going to be thinking throughout this workshop about how these three things all relate together. Because to really explore and embrace and document your family history, you're going to kind of be working between all three of these. Now, some people are going to have more in the way of pictures and objects and papers, and some people are going to have less. That's kind of how um, it is. The same with genealogical information and the same with memories and stories. These are represented in different um, levels in every family and in every context. So whatever your background is in your family is, you're going to have your own kind of unique blend. So why does this stuff matter to us and why do we even care? I'll ask a quick, this is a fun exercise, um, or maybe not so fun. I'm going to ask you a question. Take a moment to just think about it. How much do you know about your great grandparents? Not your grandparents, your great grandparents. Do you know all of their names? Do you know anything else about them? If you know their names, and a lot of people here might not know all their great grandparents' names, what else do you know about them? Maybe a little bit about where they lived? It's something interesting to think about, and it really goes to show that if you had trouble summoning any of that information, you're not alone. And it's a reminder that we're kind of just grains of sand in the grand scope of history. Um, and information can get lost pretty darn quickly throughout the generations. It only takes a couple generations for information to get lost. So I don't know, why do we care? People also care about family history in different degrees. You're probably here tonight because you're curious and you care about this. Um, but people care about family history um, to different degrees and at different points in their lives also. I'm leveraging here a popular meme on uh, the internet right now called the expanding mind meme, which is used to kind of illustrate people having their minds blown at different levels of awakening, right? So what interests us about family history? 
I think the th thought process goes a little bit something like this. We start with asking sort of these surface level questions. Who, who is my family? Where do I come from? Who were those people? And then you start to think about history a little more and you might wonder, what were their lives like? You know, what was it like to be alive then under their particular circumstances? Which then leads to another realization what does it mean to be part of history, right? We are all part of history, even if we are not famous <laughs> or important. Um, we are part of history, it's ongoing, it never stops, which leads to perhaps some ultimate existential questions about who we are as individuals and what mark we leave on the world. So I wager that this is pretty big, important stuff. Um, that lingers underneath our questions. So given that this is what we really care about, what do we do about the fact that we sometimes end up in situations like this, right? We have to make a translation between that stuff of history, right? All of the things in our world that, you know, help us understand who we are and where we come from. Um, and you know, the bigger, the bigger existential questions. Um, no, this is not my house. Um, I just Google image search hoarding um, and pulled up one of the least disturbing pictures um, that I could find on the internet. But I like this picture because the preponderance of books and papers here indicates that, you know, there are some things of genuine um, value to this person here, whoever's house this is. Um, but they're all kind of jumbled up. There's some, there's some things that signal to me that there's some history here, um, but everything is all jumbled up. Um, so one thing I uh, think that's really important, and I will state at the outset, there is hoarding in my family. And I would wager that just about everybody in attendance here tonight probably has a friend or a family member that has um, some kind of issue with hoarding, with a, a massive accumulation of stuff in their house. Um, so I really want to recommend a book that came out about 10 years ago called Stuff, Compulsive Hoarding and the Meaning of Things by Randy Frost and Gail Stetke, um, which is really helpful for understanding some cultural context about how we end up with all of this stuff. And if you have rooms in your house that look like this, Maybe you want to start thinking about opening conversations with, you know, trusted friends or family members or therapists to think a little bit about what that relationship of stuff is like in your life. Um, I think what we're realizing, part of what it means to be a historical subject living in the United States of America in the year 2020, is that this is actually kind of a common <laughs> problem to some degree um, and that we're all kind of trying to figure out to negotiate our relationship between who we are and what information is important in the world and all of this stuff um, that those experiences and that information kind of like lives in, right? So what I want to get people thinking about, the first thing we really need to master is moving, is transitioning from a mindset of saving things to a mindset of archiving things. So keep this image in your mind and now we're gonna go away from a, a hoarder kind of situation and we're gonna go into an archive, right? So here's a shot of archival storage at the McKinney Art Museum in San Antonio, Texas. We have parts of the Filson uh, Historical Society that look a lot like this as well with retractable shelving. I just thought the lighting in this picture was better than what I could get. So um, I'm giving you a little glimpse in here. So you'll notice some key differences between you know, that, that room and this room right away. Everything is organized, it's in, um, archival housing that's safe and preserved, space is maximized, things are labeled, and there's a clear sense of what lives where. So what we're really gonna be working on tonight is I wanna get people thinking about making the move from saving to archiving. Okay, well, 
let's talk about that a little more. So all archiving is saving, but not all saving is archiving. And I'm really going to be hitting this point home tonight. If you really want to preserve your family history, you need to step outside yourself. You need to look like someone, you need to be able to look into the future. This is kind of what archivists do, is we figure out, you know, what we need to save, and then we work to preserve it for the long term. So thinking a little bit about the differences between saving and archiving and how to move from one space to the next. Um, whereas saving is kind of sentimental in nature, archiving is more historical. Saving is disordered. Archiving is organized. Saving is haphazard. Archiving is intentional. Saving is overwhelming, kind of impenetrable. There's no order. Whereas archiving is accessible, right? So someone else can, can get to this material. And perhaps most importantly, saving materials means that they're kind of at risk, right? Whether that's, um, uh, from a number of, you know, environmental or, or, or circumstantial factors. Um, but archival, archiving means that things are preserved. So we're going to be trying to make some conceptual leaps from one space into the next. Um, the next couple slides I've taken from a wonderful book that I recommend called Creating Family Archives by Margot Note. She's also a family uh, archives consultant, you could hire her if you want, and she has a wonderful website called margonote.com. Um, and uh, this is a slim little volume that's fantastic. You can buy it for about $25 or so if you want on her website. So what Margot Note does is starts off by helping normal people understand like us, what are we talking about when we're talking about archival materials, right? So what are archivists actually saving? So she has a list here and I've starred the ones that I think are most important for our discussion about archiving your, your own history, right? So what gets saved in archives? or sorry, why are archives saved? We'll get to what in the next slide. slide. So we save archival materials as long-term memory um, to provide access to history and knowledge, right? So pretty self-explanatory if you wanna pass on family history there. We also save archival materials as a source for understanding and identification of ourselves, our communities, and our society. So I like to think this is what we do at the Filson. And I also started the next one for as vehicles for communicating political, social, and cultural values. Because again, our family histories are not just about us. They have value to other people um, in the future who want to understand who we were and what our lives were like. So I've also gone on to star some of um, the things she identifies as characteristics of archival material. Again, to get you thinking about, you know, what you have and how you're going to treat it as history. So archives are usually original material. A kind of rule of thumb in the, in the archives world is that the more unique and one of a kind it is, the, the more precious it is. So that means that handwritten manuscript letters and diaries are much more valuable and worthy of preservation than say newspapers, something that was mass produced and there are copies of them kind of all over the world in different repositories. I'm going to skip down to something I just touched on, which is that archives have value even after their creator has finished with them. And archivists use the term enduring value to describe their worth. And boy, that is a hard one to identify because as we're going to talk about, value is a little bit subjective, right? Um, and, and things can kind of change in value over time. So we want to make sure that the things that we save have enduring value. And I'm going to come back to that in a few slides because one of the things I believe makes things have enduring value is their level of 
um, uh, information richness, how much information they have. In them. So we'll keep talking about enduring value. Another important thing about archives is that they rely on context to give them meaning. And so information about how an item was created or how it was used is also very important to understanding um, its, its value, its enduring value. And finally, it's important to remember that archives are kept for the long term and usually forever. And this is a tremendous investment of resources and time and money. And we're going to be talking about that. And so when you do, when you're investing in saving things for the long term, you're going to have to do some cost benefit analysis and you're going to have to make some tough decisions. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, how archivists um, uh, it manage that in their work. Um, now you might be thinking, well, you can just digitize everything and save it on the cloud or on your computer forever, right? No, 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 not so fast. Digitizing is not the same as archiving or preserving. Um, so remember, we talked about what to do with a preponderance of material stuff in our world, right? We also have a preponderance of digital stuff as well. And the more we have, the more we're going to have to cull and go through and make decisions about what to save. And also, digital information is profoundly vulnerable. Um, so people think that sometimes people confuse the fact that if you do something embarrassing and it ends up on the internet, and people are gonna remember that about you for years and years, that that means that everything digital is going to be reliably saved on the internet forever and ever. It doesn't work like that. So the files that you have on your phone, on your computer, on disks and hard drives are simply not going to magically be around in 10 years. Our technology is going to be upgraded, it's going to be changed. And so digital preservation is actually a very complicated field. So I want you to just remember right now that slapping things on a disk or a hard drive or on the cloud is not the same as archiving. We have a fantasy that it is, but it's not. All right, so we're here at a, at a big takeaway moment. Again, going back to those conversations that I've had that inspired this workshop, people say to me, I want to pass down my family history, but you know, my kids aren't interested in it. So I wanna clarify, as the child of a boomer, of boomers who are constantly calling me and asking me, do I want this, do I want that? I don't have room for it all. Here's an important takeaway. Stuff is a burden. Listen to Drake here. We've got our Drake meme. We don't want boxes and boxes of stuff. Whereas stuff is a burden, an organized archive is a gift. So when we talked about some of the risks to historical material, if I were to ask you what's the number one threat to historical material, here are some of the things that usually people say, fire, floods, theft. Okay, those are big risks to historical materials, but people don't think about some other risks that are out there. Things like mergers, moves, divorces, deaths. Times of transition are the most dangerous time for historical materials because when there's a transition in a life and people have to come in and they open up a garage and this is what they're faced with, they're not gonna be able to go through it all. It will probably get pitched. Nobody wants to deal with that. But if you consolidate and you do that curatorial archival work, you really put in the work and you get the history kind of pulled together, that is a gift that I promise you, your kids will are likely to treasure. So why does that process feel like so much work, right? How do we get from picture on the top to picture down below? because it is a lot of work. <laughs> and here's a spoiler. This program is, is kind of in way, you know, I'm doing this program for you, my wonderful audience, the people interested in family history. But in some ways, I'm also doing it for me and for my colleagues, because I want people to understand how much work it is to actually archive and preserve history. It is not magic. 
It is a lot of work and a lot of it can be, frankly, kind of tedious. So that's okay. I want to bring you into that process because the more that we kind of distribute that labor, the more history that, that we can save. So in order to do this work, I want you to start thinking, imagining yourself a little bit like both a curator and an archivist and a historian. And I've summoned um, our little 1970s uh, comics flashback, the, the Wonder Twins, um, because I really believe that curators and archivists and historians work together. We have separate jobs, but they're also related. And I'm very lucky in that I get to do a little bit of both in my job. So I want to empower you to do a little bit of both when you approach your personal and your family history. So let's talk about what curators and archivists and historians do. Curators and archivists collect, protect, organize, contextualize, and facilitate access. They do other things too, believe me, we're busy all day long. But roughly, that's the kind of scope in our, our job, right? A curator is, um, is a caretaker. Um, and so we work on getting that stuff organized, accessible, all that stuff we talked about in that Venn diagram earlier about how archiving is different from um, saving. So what do historians do? Then historians take that material that has been preserved and organized and contextualized they get access to it and they study it, they interrogate it, they ask questions, they interpret it, they narrate it, they come up with stories and they even teach it, which is um, really the wonderful stuff that we get to do in a lot of our lectures here at the Filson is to learn from the work that historians do. So I think we all know that history is much more than just rattling off factoids, right? It's interpreting raw information and trying to understand, you know, what happened and when and where. Um, and the stuff we're living through today, surprise, is going to be the history of the future. So you're going to need to think a little bit like a curator or archivist and also like a historian who's going to blast off into the future. I brought my friend Marie Kondo here. If anyone has watched um, Tidying Up with Marie Kondo, it's a lovely show. Um, and I think it provides a really interesting and compelling kind of counterpart to a TV show like Hoarders. So whereas Hoarders was really an emphasis on kind of like the worst case scenarios of houses that have become completely overrun with stuff to the point where they're not livable anymore. It created a real pathology around accumulation. Marie Kondo starts from a different kind of point of orientation, which is that the assumption that we live in a world where everybody's a little bit overrun by stuff. So again, that idea of, you know, we're all sifting through, we're trying to fi figure out what has value and what doesn't have value. So I tried to imagine if Marie Kondo was helping us here with history, these are some things, I don't know, some truisms that I've channeled based on her. Um, remember, saving everything equals saving nothing, basically, um, realistically. Because like we said, when someone opens that basement door or that storage container, um, they're not necessarily going to be able to go through it. And they won't even understand it the way you do. So it's better to save some things and save them well, then save everything very poorly and it'll just get thrown away. So you're gonna also need to prioritize what matters and think about the use value of those things. And we'll get into that a little bit more. You also want to consider where else things might be saved. Remember, archives put a premium on original, unique material. So you might not necessarily need all the magazines and newspapers or even the books um, if those are stored in other um, you know, repositories. Where else might you be able to access those things? This is a really important one, and we're going to get into it in the next slides. Think about questioning the relationships between sentimental attachment and informational value. 
And this is a very, very hard one. And it's gonna be different for everybody because again, we're all different and our histories are all different, but that's gonna be a hard one. We'll work on it. And to remember that sometimes we make mistakes. We're so scared of throwing away the wrong thing. You know, and I have to say, curators and archivists have to deal with this all the time. I am absolutely terrified of saying no to something that someone offers me and it turns out to be a big mistake. But again, there's that cost benefit analysis. Space is limited. If you're really preserving things forever, you have temperature and humidity control, you have light situations, you have rent, you have storage. We cannot save everything. So cut yourself a break and recognize that you might throw away something that's important, but that's okay, because you're still going to be working on the big picture and we will end with the big picture. So I promised that we were gonna come back to that, uh, that term, enduring value, and try to get our hands around a really slippery concept of what is enduring value, right? So um, some things it's kind of easy to determine their value if they have some kind of monetary value on the market, right? Like if you have a painting in your house, um, you know, by an artist of recognition, um, you might be able to sell that on the market for, um, for money, right? Um, but that really doesn't, you know, define a lot of things that comprise our family history. Most of it, most of the stuff we hang on to is of a much more, you know, everyday nature. And everyday stuff is good because we want to know history at the everyday level, um, but we can't hang on to everything. So here's my analogy. Um, and I say, perhaps somewhat harshly, flattery and good feelings are but snacks in the cupboard of history. Nobody in this world loves potato chips and soda more than I do. Um, they are delicious and fun to eat. The same way that my certificates of achievement and my uh, plane tickets from fun vacations, um, or frankly for that matter, even my diplomas, and I have a good collection of diplomas, they make me feel good, right? But we have to ask questions in the long term, how much informational value can we extract from these items as they are? How much interpretation and questioning and study can we really get out of these things to pass them on in the future? The funny thing about sentimental attachment is that we have been coached to live our lives privileging important historic moments above all else. But that's simply not the reality of how life is. Yes, my wedding dress, it was a pantsuit, hangs in my closet. It is very dear to me, especially because it was handmade by a gifted artist friend of mine. It's very important to me, but I'll tell you what, and anyone who's married knows there's a lot more to being married in that wedding dress. And if somebody really wanted to know about me and my marriage, <laughs> there would be a lot of other things that they could extract a lot more information from than that particular wedding dress. Some wedding dresses have phenomenal histories though. For instance, one in my family um, that was worn and altered by multiple generations of women. I think three generations of women a total of about you know eight or nine women have worn the same wedding dress. That's a wedding dress with some history. That's an object potentially with some argument for enduring value. If it's a beautiful dress that you bought off the rack and it made you feel like a princess for a day, I'm sure it was wonderful. I'm not sure it has enduring historical value. The irony is that people sometimes throw away the things that actually have enduring historical value because they think they're boring, because they don't actually speak to those epic moments in life. Um, and here's my analogy. These are the things that we should be eating, right? Um, information rich nutrition, a well balanced meal with lots of vegetables and full grains. So again, these are those unique Items, these are one of a kind, letters, diaries, board minutes, um, and ephemera produced by local organizations or groups that you were a part of. 
these, there's only one of these things in the world, right? Or they're in very limited quantity. And when we study them, think about how much information we can extract. As a historian, as an archivist, these are the things I'm gonna want to collect when I'm working with people on how to collect their history. It doesn't mean that I personally have time to sit down and read every one of these letters, but researchers do. That's what they do. They go through this material and they ask questions and they learn who, what, where, when, why, what were people thinking, what were people feeling, what were they doing? That is the stuff of history. You're going to get a lot more out of that than you will out of a certificate of achievement. All right, so this is my last slide. And then we're going to open up for some questions. Um, and this is where I'm going to uh, kind of give you a little bit of soft homework if you want. So like I said, tonight was all about big concepts, big ideas to kind of get you thinking, get some conversations going between you and your family members, um, and get you kind of surveying what family history looks like in your own circumstances. The stories, the genealogy, the stuff. And what I want to get people thinking towards as you move from saving to archiving is a little uh, patented method I've come up with. <laughs> Everything has to be a buzzword, right? I call it spin. I want you to put your spin on history. And spin stands for saving with purpose intention, and narratives. So think about your purpose. Why am I saving? And for whom? Who is the audience here? What are you trying to do with this stuff? Um, is it for your grandchildren? Is it to consider donating to an archival institution like the Folsom Historical Society? Um, you know, what's your stake in this? Your intention is then moving on to what will I save and how will I save it? And that's starting to really go through your stuff and do like your own kind of appraisal and going through some of those things we talked about before with, um, with Marie Kondo, asking some of those tough questions. And finally, you're gonna be saving with narratives in mind. Because we know, again, history is not just factoids, it's stories. And archivists need context. They have to develop and build that context. So you should really be thinking, what stories does my history contain or does it relate to? Is this just the family story of your parents and your grandparents and all that stuff? Or are there stories in here related to big, you know, themes and questions in history? Movement across, you know, across parts of the country or different country, the rise and fall of different job industries as they change over time, women's history, black history, all kinds of history. What kind of stories does your history contain? Because you're going to need those to wrap them together and figure out how you're going to save it um, and what you're ultimately going to do with it. So next week, we're going to get deeper into that. I'm going to talk about some of the dangers of being overly focused on narratives, right? Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the specifics of archival arrangement and preservation. And I'm going to bring in a guest speaker too, my friend um, Ken Grossman, who has been working on, uh, on uh, his family history for a couple years now. And so he's going to share a little bit about his journey and his products. Um, and again, this is a long haul game. You might not be able to bang this out in a weekend because it is a lot of work. Um, but that's okay because you learn a tremendous amount uh, in so many ways during the process. So I think that leaves us, we're right at uh, 646. I'm going to unshare my screen um, and then we can do some questions. Thank you so much. Fantastic job, Abby. I really enjoyed that. I've got a page full of notes myself. Reminder to everybody, please put your questions into the chat box and we will relay them to Abby. 
To get us started, though, uh, Emma posed a really good question. How do we start this work of, uh, of spinning uh, our family history if we have what we know to be a fragmented record with different branches of the family in different locations? Where do we start there? Uh, this is something we encounter all the time, right? History gets split up between different members of the family. And sometimes that means the physical items, the pictures or, you know, the mementos end up with different siblings. But also sometimes the knowledge is split up between people unevenly as well. Remember, this is because we all have different personalities. I think that every family has maybe one or two people in it that are more in, innately more interested in this than other people. Um, so what I would say is, um, is that this is an opportunity to start some conversations with your family, if that is possible. Again, everybody's family is different. You might be the only in your family. You might not know your birth parents. You might be estranged from your siblings. You might have any number of things going on. But I would say that that first step is kind of starting to take stock and think who are, I'm interested in this. Is there anybody else in my family who is interested in this and who has stuff too? And then you can get in touch with them and compare notes because um, I think that a, another thing we learn about the relationship between activists and historians is that history is actually much more collaborative than we think it is. It's not just an individual genius stuff alone in the library. It's people reaching out to others and asking questions and sharing information. So I would say, think about that the, if the history is scattered about in different parts of your family, it might be an opportunity to draw closer to your family and to try to combine resources. And these days, so much information can be shared via email or even text messages or pictures, and you could think a little bit about pulling it together, both the things, but also the stories and the information and collaborate a little. Absolutely. We've got a, a lot of fantastic questions that all hit around um, some of the, the, the thoughts about selectivity in, in an archive, right, that's preserving a family history. How does an archive like the Filson uh, make decisions when they get uh, handed a big box of, of family history materials? And, and then maybe um, what are some, and this might be a separate question, what are some things that someone who's looking to donate some family history materials to a research archive be looking for in that archive? What should they be asking? Yeah, these are, these are the stuff of our daily lives, right? I'm very lucky that I get to handle these questions on a daily basis, but that does not mean that they are easy. This is hard mental work for you, and it's hard mental work for me, people. Um, but there isn't a, because there isn't a perfect formula. So the Filson Historical Society's mission is kind of deceptively simple, right? Our job at the Filson is to collect and preserve and tell the significant stories of Kentucky and the Ohio Valley region. Okay, well, who defines significant, right? For a long time, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, certain kinds of family histories, right? Um, you know, maybe kind of like wealthy families, who, the movers and the shakers. In Yiddish, we call them machers, the important people, right? The people who really make history. Those were the stories that we focused on. And that's largely because the way that history was taught and understood for a long time was through the great men of history, the presidents, the military generals, um, you know, the big important people. Well, I don't know about you, I get kind of left out of that history. But fortunately, we've had some corrections and changes in the way we do history that really started in the, it, I mean, in the 60s and 70s, we've started to embrace um, people's history, history from the ground up, um, and, you know, minority histories and all kinds of other ways of looking at history. So there isn't one way that history, that 
family history is important, right? You don't need to be, you don't necessarily need to be rich <laughs> or famous to have an important family history. But we are looking, you know, to be able to tell some stories, right? Um, unfortunately, I left it in the other room. A book just came across my path that was published by the Indiana Jewish Historical Society a few years ago that was a history of the Jewish scrap dealers of Indiana. Did you know that there were all these scrap dealers that that was a business that people got into? I mean, there is literally a history of like garbage collecting, right? But that was a way that families made their money, um, you know, and there was a whole network and culture around there. And so there's a kind of, um, there are stories there. So what we're looking for is those stories and for people to be able to help us understand what the stories are in their family history and to help us do some of that work of the organizational work of getting the things prepared a little bit for donation um, because the more organized and, and pulled better the material it is when it comes to us, the better job that we can do of preserving it and, and, and spreading our time more equally amongst a lot of other different histories instead of getting bogged down in one history collection that's in very messy conditions. So those are some things we're looking for. We're looking for stories that are interesting and that matter and for people to kind of help us do some of that really difficult labor involved in preparing the materials for um, permanent preservation. <laughs> I love that. And I wonder if we could flip the question and, and get back to the people who are looking to donate stuff. Should they be asking questions of an archive that they are thinking about donating to? And what should they know uh, about that place where they're thinking about donating their family history? Mm. That's really interesting. I so I think there's a couple different questions here, right? One question is, how do you know the archive that's right for you and your family history, right? Um, there are different collecting institutions um, in different areas, right? Universities usually have um, archival collections as well. So our friends at the University of Louisville also collect. We have um, KHS in Frankfurt. You know, we have a number of institutions in the state of Kentucky that collect. Um, and sometimes things end up in really different places. So for instance, somebody could have, you know, grown up in Kentucky, but maybe they are an alumna of um, a school on the East Coast, right? or something like that, and they really want their collections to be in the archives at that university. So they might try to talk to them um, about that. Different collections, different collecting institutions have different kind of scopes and mandates, right? And so you want to try to find a place. I mean, I think it kind of goes without saying that, you know, we're interested in keeping Kentucky history here. There's no need to ship it off to Idaho for some reason. Um, we want to, to keep the history here. Um, so there are a lot of different considerations about where, where it will go. Um, in terms of the questions that people should be asking, I would say that a lot of, a lot of my curatorial work involves talking with people and I ask, you know, kind of like, it's a conversation about, well, what do you have? And what, you know, why is it significant? A lot of times, you know, someone will call me and the first thing they want to offer is a wedding dress, <laughs> right? Because they, they, you know, again, that was a very special day and they have a wedding dress. And, um, and so, you know, we talked already tonight a little bit about wedding dresses and I, I, I this was maybe going to come up next week. I will tell it to you right now. The box that we use at the Filson to store, just the box to store a wedding dress, to store a garment. Uh, textiles are the, some of the hardest and most um, really expensive and difficult things to conserve. So the box we use to put a dress in costs about $400. So we're really committed, the things that we're gonna save, we're committing to saving forever. So that's $400. So we gotta come up with that money somewhere, right? 
So a lot of times someone will say, I want to donate a wedding dress. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, tell me more about your family. Within 10 minutes, it turns out, oh, well, you know, my mother was also, you know, one of the first sociologists you know, <laughs> to, to teach sociology at, you know, Indiana University. And she conducted this big study and I have all of her research notes and they're in a box. And I said, oh, well, that's really cool. We can, I feel like I know more about your mother and more about her life from that particular thing than the wedding dress. So we, we talk a lot about things and we talk about what kind of order the materials are in, what kind of order they could be in, what kind of condition they're in. Sadly, sometimes people's history has gotten really damaged from environmental factors and it's really, really hard preserve. Um, so those are some of the, the questions as well. Um, and that just reminded me, actually, we'll talk a little bit about photographs last week, but my colleague, Heather Potter, who I believe is in this workshop. Hi, Heather, who's our curator of um, prints and photographs, also led a workshop this summer on preserving and archiving family photos, which are kind of a whole, you know, a whole other animal. So we can go even deeper into that because um, you know, photographs are something that's kind of likely to get damaged. They're kind of delicate. So we want to know about the collection, uh, sorry, the condition of the materials as well. Fantastic response. And that, that touched on one of the other really interesting questions that, that just came in about how much does it cost for the Filson to have a, a, a sort of shelving every year. And uh, I love that question because it, it really gets to, to exactly what you said about this being a long-term investment in the institution um, in, in that history. I wonder um, if we could talk a little bit about um, how, uh, how, how this, this act of spinning can help reduce those costs um, for, uh, for the archive and then how that makes, you know, your, your family's history more likely to end up preserved in a really stable institution. Absolutely. Um, Gary, thank you so much for that question. And to quickly answer that question, we're working on trying to actually get those numbers. And it's something we've been in conversation with on the staff for a long time, right? Um, but I think it's really important, you know, for people to understand that what a commitment to keep something forever is, especially when we're doing it in a way that makes it accessible, it's not a jumbled mess, but it's cataloged, it's searchable, right, that pe researchers could come in and, and look at that stuff. And we're going to talk next week about how to start mimicking or not mimicking, enacting, I should say, some of that work in your own family history. So kind of exerting order and working on kind of narrating. Now, as you recall, one of the first slides I put up was like a little round bubble where we had genealogy and information, stories and memories, and then also stuff, right? So to Patrick's refinement of the question here, how as you're putting your spin on that, you need to be able to put these, these components in dialogue with each other. Um, how do those things relate to each other? They might make sense, make sense to you, like you could pick up, you know, a, a diary from a box and say, ah, oh, this was my grandpa's back. You know, he was, he had the coolest gun collection. Um, you know, really cool things, right? No one else is going to know that. Someone has to do the work of kind of narrating, you know, this is what's in this box, and this is who these people are, and this is how they relate to each other, and this is what the material kind of touches on and documents, right? So next week, we're going to be talking, we're going to be looking at a document called a Finding aid, which um, archives use, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you can create your own finding aid. But again, this work is, and this is the brain work, where you have to be kind of an archivist and a historian. You don't have to write the entire story of your family of everyone who ever lived and breathed. You probably don't have time for that. But you do need to be able to create some of that context for your material. Because if I open up a little box and I can tell right away 
roughly what's in here, what are the major things it touches on, et cetera. Now we're in business, right? That is so much easier than confronting a sea of chaos. So hopefully that, you know, leads us nicely a little bit into next week where we try to transfer some from big concepts into some more um, concrete actions. And again, Ken will tell us a little bit about what his, his journey has been like as well. Fantastic, Abby. That's the perfect cliffhanger. We are right at seven o'clock. Um, Abby's email is in the chat. Um, we will be posting this video uh, as well for you to watch. Invite your friends to watch it before you join us next week. Thank you so much, Abby. Thank you all. I hope to see you next week. <laughs>